how do you read the Patronus? We talked about it, how it's this, you know, you have to concentrate with all your might on a happy memory. And then this is how, you know, along with, you know, the, the words, this is how you, you conjure this Patronus. So, so how do you read the, the Patronus sort of working? Well, for me, I suppose what I take from that, and again, this is just very personally, probably the way I work, is that I have a choice in this. You know, when the Dementor comes in the room, I actually have a choice about what to do. There is a course of action I can do. And the course of action I can do is to not allow, is not, not to like just lay down on the floor and let the Dementor suck out my soul. <laughs> I can do other things, which then would actually be quite, you know, often quite simple things and, you know, sort of relate back to mindfulness, light, exercise, sleep. Um, you know, that if I do all those things, then I'm less likely to be so vulnerable to the attack of the dementors. And that there are things, you know, I have a really, and, and it's, I, it's very difficult, I think, to think that all this stuff out whilst depressed. So what I've learned over the years is I, I basically get my well self when I'm well, which I often am, I think it all through and I very carefully work out. Again, I I am the loop in to my Harry. I explain to myself what I must do when the dementors come. And then when the dementors come, I've got a protocol, I've got a, a, a practice, you know, um, and I know I know what to do. And some of those things are about not allowing myself to be too hungry and not allowing myself to be too cold and working out how to reframe in the moment and so it's not it's not as anything like having a single happy memory that I concentrate on with all my mind but what are the useful things I can tell myself when the dementors hove into view is a, is is a really useful thing for me to do yeah that makes sense I think it also I also read it in terms of a, a wider grief reading that if you know well again it kind of goes back to how you remember embody the person who has died. And, you know, there's the kind of amazing moment when, when Harry first makes his first, you know, conjures his first proper Patronus. And he sees, well, he sees, you know, the, the stag coming across. He looks to see who it is and he thinks it's his father. Mm -hmm. And it's only later with the time turner and the rest of it that he realizes it's not his father. He is the one who has conjured the Patronus. But, you know, the stag, the form it takes is very significant mm -hmm. because this is the form that his father would transform into um, when he, you know, took animal form um, as an animagus. And so, but, but there's a way in which, again, if we think about compared to the mirror, this is a way in which he is making his father present but in this very active, creative, sort of loving way. Um, it, it sort of goes to the continuing bonds, we might say, in grief and how the relationship continues with the person who's died. They're part of us. They shape how we see and what we do, um, even though they, they are not physically with us. And there's a, there's a lovely moment when I think, again, it goes back to what you said, Kathy, about how we are given these little lovely explanations that then help us to read it um, where Dumbledore tells him, you know, why, you know, why has this happened? And he, and he says to Harry, you think the dead we have loved ever truly leave us. You think we don't recall them more clearly than ever in times of great trouble. Your father is alive in you, Harry, and shows himself most plainly when you have needed him. How else could you produce that particular Patronus? Prongs wrote again last night, so you did see your father last night, Harry. You found him inside yourself. Mm. And again, I think that's a sort of beautiful expression of the way, you know, we integrate the people who have died. They live within us, but also how they can provide a kind of protection, you know, from the darkness. It's those loving bonds that help us to get through the dark periods rather than, you know, shutting them out. So I, yeah, yeah, I completely agree. And I think it's an, another offering because one of the things, because that's not how I now feel my relationship with my brother is I have this enduring relationship with him, but I didn't have for years. And I think I was very confused about, I, I think I, I think I thought you had to have religious belief to have the relationship. Um, and so, yeah, and then I kind of found, an, and then I think Harry Potter just offered another way of thinking about that. 
Yeah. Um, I definitely remember that, just feeling very confused sort of in my mid-twenties that I'd like to in some way believe in the continuing presence of him, but do, did I have to believe in God to have that? And, no. you know, now But you can just, I you can believe in DNA, like. you know, as well. Yeah. You, can believe it, you know what I mean? Because, yeah. And you can believe in our, our identity is, is formed through our relationships. And, and also DNA that we see, I, you know, I see it all the time. I was really struck in one of your books, and I can't remember which one, Kathy, where you talk about how when you finally started feeling the pain and remembering the hard stuff, that also you got back the happy memories with your brother. Yeah. And I always found that really powerful, that there's a way in which if you close off one set of memories, you close off all of them. Yeah, I think that's really true. And I do think that's a re- that is the reward offered, actually, by... A- by a you know when people w- want to write about what's happened to them and are scared of it and it, it, I've seen this happen with lots of people if they if they can do it um and of course they have to do it carefully and respectfully so often th- th- they will be rewarded by all this other stuff that they didn't know was trapped in there with the with the with the fear stuff and I did definitely think um my friend Julia Samuel a grief therapist talks about the disinfectant of daylight and that's true as well everything that you think is so awful it is so much more awful when it's trapped inside you and you won't talk about it N- nothing is ever worse actually when you hold it up to the light in my experience um so yeah so i think that's again and there's a lot of light the patronus is you know that that sense of light there's a lot of light in harry potter as well and there's definitely that sense that and you know this is really my experience especially when people have had um, really hard lives. I do think the truest, uh, all sorts of privileges we all have, but actually I think the, 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 the real one is to have been parented by someone who loves you. Um, that, that, that I think in my, in my experience of spending time with people, you know, in prisons, you often encounter people who haven't. That, that's the real, you know, so to just to be able to attach to the fact that whether people are here in the present is, maybe less important in a way than if you have if you have been loved you know what an utter privilege it is to have been loved by anyone and um, it, yeah and again the, the harry potter imagery of that is the way that you know it protects him and it kind of imprints into him and yeah. is part of him and 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 part of what you know his strength is his ability to love and care and have friendship 